Uh, welcome to the uh, meeting of the Libertarian Alliance. We meet here every month, uh, and uh, this month we have Christian Nimitz on the, on the economy of political correctness. Uh, Thank you, David. Good evening. I'm going to talk about political correctness from an economic perspective. Now, I don't have a, an academically solid definition of what political correctness really is. I use the term more in a sort of you know it when you see it sort of way. But I should probably start with uh, some remarks about what political correctness is not, because there's a couple of misunderstandings floating around. Uh, sometimes you get the, the idea that political correctness is really just a form of being very polite, trying to avoid offense. Well, that is absolutely not what political correctness is. If I insulted people randomly, if I started shouting abuse at you, but in a, in a completely random fashion, unrelated to demographic characteristics such as ethnicity, uh, religion or, or, or gender or whatever, then you would call that behavior obnoxious, rude, aggressive, but you wouldn't call it politically incorrect. You wouldn't say this is un-PC behavior. So there has to be something else. And at the same time, those of you who have had discussions with, uh, with social justice warriors, with uh, politically super correct people on social media, will know that politeness is not necessarily their, their forte. So you can be extremely rude and still be politically correct and the same thing uh, the other way round. And also, uh, all of these cases where people have been arrested for um, saying un-PC things on social media or shouting racial abuse on, on public transport, those sort of cases, uh, that wouldn't happen, wouldn't have happened if it had been random abuse. If you just shout at someone randomly, you get kicked out of the tube. You might have your Oyster card revoked, which, which is what should happen, of course. That's the, the sane way of dealing with troublemakers. But you, you wouldn't be reported for the, uh, to the police for that, uh, because of the, the, the role of the police is not to enforce nice behavior or even just civil behavior um, and this is where in this sense equating political correctness to, with just good behavior uh, uh, being polite not causing offense is clearly not true now you could say well okay maybe it's not about politeness per se but surely it is about uh, not saying disparaging things about identifiable groups groups that you can have some something in common, some, uh, an ethnic group, a religious group or whatever. But even that is not really what political correctness is. Actually, you can make disparaging remarks about whole groups and still be politically correct, as long as you're talking about a group that is perceived as somehow powerful, or at least uh, as not oppressed, as not a victim group. So if you are anti-American, if you say disparaging things about Americans as a group, that wouldn't be politically incorrect. Actually, even anti-Semitism can be politically correct if it is dressed up as concern for Palestinians. It can at least get a free pass in politically correct circles. And actually, my, my uh, favorite example of uh, disparaging remarks about groups as a whole being politically correct is this diversity officer at Goldsmith University, who or now ex uh, ex diversity officer, who used the hashtag "Kill All White Men" on Twitter. Now that is, of course, not to be taken literally, but uh, that that is not say a, a, a nice remark to make about a group, but that still is politically correct in a sense because that was turned against a group which in the politically correct social justice warrior worldview is an oppressor group. So therefore, you get permission to make uh, remarks like that. And then there's the, uh, there's the idea that um, even so, maybe political correctness then is about not saying negative things about a group that is perceived as marginalized, not uh, make not have negative prejudices about some victim group. 
But even that isn't exactly right, because social justice warriors would never criticize bigotry when it emanates in minority communities that have victim status themselves. So an example here, a couple of weeks ago, there was a, a, a conference in Paris, a conference of Islamic scholars, and they had one panel discussions where they had two radical imams. They were talking about, the panel was about whether it is permissible for husbands to beat their wives. What was the religious perspective on that? Now, you would think that feminist groups would get a bit upset about that. Imagine this had been a Catholic group setting up a panel like that. They would have shut it down, obviously. It would never have happened. In this case, the reaction was quite different. There were just two protesters on site. They were then beaten up by the uh, security forces of the event organizers. And whose side did the Guardian newspaper take afterwards? Well, they sided with the conference organizers, of course. They were accusing them implicitly of being Islamophobic and racist. So the Guardian, the, the voice of political correctness in, a, in, a, in, in some ways, they were not siding with whom they would traditionally have seen as the victim group, because clearly here uh, there is a hierarchy in the, in the politically correct view of the world, a hierarchy of victim groups and some groups have a stronger claim to being victims than others and therefore in this case it was the feminists who were actually the bad guys because they were trying to disrupt um, an Islamic meeting even though it was a topic that social justice warriors would otherwise of course uh, have strongly opposed and also at Goldsmith University again last week or so they had some they had a speaker who was an ex-muslim now a feminist and she was uh i think she, she was allowed to speak there were uh, calls to no platform her before she was then allowed to speak but there was an uh, the the, uh, the islamic society of goldsmith university was trying to disrupt the meeting and later on, the Feminist Society of Goldsmith University and the LGBT Society were siding with the people who tried to disrupt the meeting and not with the speaker. So you, you can't even say political correctness is uh, when you're especially concerned about sexism or when you're especially concerned about homophobia or so, because at the same time, a social justice warrior would not criticize sexism and would not criticize homophobia when it emanates from groups that, uh, in their view of the world, has an even stronger claim to victimhood. In that case, they would gladly make either excuses for it or at least pretend that it, uh, it didn't exist. So it's not, it's neither about uh, not, not uh, having group prejudices, nor about being very strongly opposed to sexism and, and homophobia. That is not what political correctness is. Um, and neither is it about just about style, just about trying to say things in a non-offensive way. So if if you take the example of um, of the, the criminal justice system about the fact that the prison population is not doesn't have the same composition as the population as a whole that some groups are overrepresented now the the politically correct interpretation of this is that this is because the criminal justice system is racist it's biased against some groups that's of course a possibility, but that's an empirical question. It could also be that differences in incarceration rates reflect differences in crime rates in the crime statistics. And that's a possibility. I don't know enough about, um, about <coughs> crime and about uh, criminal statistics. But I'm just saying it's, it's an empirical question. It, it's, it's a possibility, a case you could make. Now, is there any way in which you could express that thought 
while still being politically correct, even if you are polite, even if you avoid make uh, negative stereotypes. No, because political correctness isn't about style. It's not about how you say things. It really is about what you say. So some ideas are just inherently politically incorrect. It doesn't matter how you express them. Some ideas are in themselves thought crimes. Another example here would be the, uh, the, the so-called gender pay gap, which is again, again the same story, where uh, you have some statistical outcome, in this case men earning on, aver on average more than, than women, several possible explanations. The politically correct explanation is this is because of sexism at work. It's employers discriminating against women. That's a possibility, but again, it's an empirical question. You can actually, uh, there, uh, there are competing explanations. And actually, I have a, a colleague who wrote about, wrote a book about this a couple of years ago, in which he showed that actually you can explain almost all of the, the gender pay gap, the variation, by if you control for differences in preferences, that on average, women make different choices in the labor force than men and that that sort of those differences uh, in, in the choices that people make can explain almost all of the, the variation in, in pay. But again, that's a politically incorrect idea. If you say that on the radio, you will get attacked for that. It doesn't matter how you say it. So the idea that, uh, that political correctness is about phrasing things in a, in a cautious way, avoiding negative stereotypes and, and, and so forth. That is not true. There are some things that you cannot say. It doesn't matter how you phrase them, how polite or how cautious and how, how careful. In, in that case, the, uh, the interpretation would, would, would always be that if you try to explain the gender pay gap empirically, you are making excuses for the patriarchy or you are trying to, to justify discrimination and, and, and so forth. So, Again, uh, this is about declaring certain ideas beyond the pale and not certain uh, ways of expressing them or um, just forcing people to be, to be nicer to each other. That's not what political correctness is about either. Now, among libertarians, I've sometimes heard the explanation that um, political correctness is really just a form of economic self-interest that you get a huge, uh, you get a segment of the of the labor market, which is the diversity industry. People make money from nurturing grievances, from telling uh, groups that they are oppressed and that they need special government programs to rectify um, discrimination, either uh, that happens today or that happens happened in the past. Correcting for for history in some way. Um, but again, political correctness actually cannot be explained in that way uh, as, as uh, by just appealing to, to economic self-interest because this diversity industry is actually a relatively new phenomenon and, and so are most anti-discrimination laws. I mean, yeah, some, some of them go back to the 70s, but they were very much expanded only about 10 years ago or so. so uh, political correctness is not primarily something that the state does. In this case, the state is more jumping on the bandwagon once the train is already in, in motion. So later on, you had the growth in the diversity industry, you had uh, politicians trying to, to show, I'm a good person, I care about victim groups, and therefore I hire 100 diversity officers here. But that's a relatively recent phenomenon, and, and even so, the number of, uh, of people who, who take part in politically correct witch hunts is vastly greater than the number of people who could ever work in, uh, in say, for an employment tribunal or in some bureaucracy that is somehow about creating diversity. It's just not big enough to be explained in that way. Now, having, having said that, I still think you can explain political correctness indirectly by using your Econ 101 textbook.
but not in the narrow sense of just appealing to self-interest. I think it makes much more sense to think of politically correct opinions as a form of status symbol. So a politically correct opinion is a marker of social status. The idea that people use political ideas to, uh, to express status, to communicate something about themselves, is not novel at all. It's, it's actually something that you've all come across in one way or another. Just imagine you are at some event and you meet two people who you've never met before. And let's say you know nothing about their social background. You don't know how education they have, how much they earn, what social class they are in. Let's say they dress in a completely class-neutral way, talk in a class-neutral way. You can't say anything about them. And now, for some reason, your conversation turns to politics. And one of them starts moaning about genetically modified food or about the power of big supermarkets. And the other one starts moaning about foreigners coming here and taking the jobs of British workers. Even if you know nothing about these people, you would immediately draw conclusions about their social background. Why? Well, because moaning about GM food is a high status opinion. It's an opinion that is associated with high levels of, of education, maybe intelligence, maybe to a lesser extent wealth. And moaning about immigration is considered a low status opinion, it has a whiff of, of Daily Mail. Uh, it, it's the sort of uh, view that even if you secretly agree with it, you wouldn't parade it in polite society because you, you, you know exactly what connotations that uh, would have. And just to be clear here, I'm not suggesting that people who express high status opinions are just doing that out of opportunism. I'm not saying that this is just pure signaling that people are, are being opportunistic and lying, that they secretly believe something else. That's not my argument at all. I'm fairly convinced that uh, people who, who express high status views at that moment really do believe it. But I'd rather say it's more like the fact that we perceive certain styles, certain ways of dressing or of talking or of uh, particular styles of music as tacky and we perceive others as classy. Why? There's nothing inherently tacky or inherently classy about any way of, of dressing. If somebody arrived from a different planet, they wouldn't know why we think of uh, a character like Vicky Pollard as being uh, dressed in a tacky way. That, that's very much something that only, or even a time traveler from a hundred years ago wouldn't understand that, why we all have this association. But the fact is you perceive it in that way because you know that other people do it too. And so it is with political opinions. And if there is, if there are opinions that are considered high status and you know it, and the others are low status and you know it, that will somehow cloud and affect your judgment as well. That will make you more sympathetic to trying to find truth in the high status opinions and trying to find fault in low status opinion, opinions. And in, in that way, I think people gravitate towards politically correct views because they are an extreme example of high status views in, in, in certain settings, certainly in academia, large parts of the media. A politically correct opinion would be a marker of a high social status. It would be a way of expressing that you are a sophisticated, well-educated, right-on person, and um, you gain social approval for, for uh, saying that. And in that way, a politically correct opinion is very much like a Rolex watch. It's, a, it's, it's something that you, that you use not for its practical value. It's not that uh, you, you use to, the Rolex watch because it shows you the time. Uh, a, a 10 pence clock could also show you the time. No, you, you use it to express something about yourself. And that is, if once you start thinking about politically correct views in that way, a number of things that otherwise seem illogical suddenly start making sense. So this uh, uh, phenomenon that I alluded to earlier, why would somebody bang on about sexism, bang on about 
uh, homophobia in, in contexts where these phenomena are, are really very rare, but at the same time excuse them or, or try to, to explain them away in instances where they are actually quite frequent. Well, it makes sense if you think of it as a status signaling activity, because there is no, no social status to be gained for saying there are homophobic incidents in, in Tower Hamlets. But if you say there are homophobic incidents at your university, then you go up in the social ranking. And uh, when, once you, you start thinking about it and, and, and looking at it through that lens, as a lot of behaviors that otherwise would seem irrational suddenly make a, a lot of, of sense. And I think that's the mistake that a lot of clever people on the left are making. People like Nick Cohen, uh, who wrote this book about 10 years ago, What's Left, in which he wrote about why people on the, on, on the left uh, profess that they are concerned about <coughs> victimhood, but then make excuses for, uh, or, or while, while they're banging on about relatively trivial cases, at the same time, they're, they're, they're willing to make excuses for much more severe cases when they, uh, when they occur within a minority community. And um, Nick Cohen is, is furious about that because he takes these politically correct arguments at, at face value. And if you do that, it seems illogical that uh, you would, for example, excessively police a university for politically incorrect behavior, because a Western university campus is probably the, the, the most politically correct place in, in, in the world that you could think of. There's, there's no place uh, outside of a Western university campus where you will uh, find so much sensitivity to these issues. And yet, those are also places of, uh, of very intense monitoring, inward monitoring, and, and that's something that makes no sense if you take um, if you take these people's claims at, at face value. Because that would then be like, imagine you are an anti-alcohol campaigner and you have limited funds. You can campaign in a neighborhood where people have a pint every, every week, an occasional pint. And here you have an area where uh, almost everybody is a heavy drinker. Uh, which of these two areas do you focus your resources on? Well, if you think logically, of course, you go for the, the heavy drinker uh, area. Even if you are a teetotaler, even if you think nobody should ever drink a drop of alcohol, you would still say, yeah, I'm, I'm not happy about these occasional drinkers, but clearly my, my priorities at the moment are, are the heavy drinkers. And, I have limited resources. I have to target my resources on, on that, that group. And uh, social justice warriors that um, that dedicate ninety nine percent of their time to, to what what is now called microaggressions and, and phenomena like somebody complimenting somebody on. Uh, on their profile picture on LinkedIn and that becoming a national story. Uh, somebody saying this is a stunning picture and that becoming uh, an egregious example of, of sexism and objectification and so forth. While at the same time, there are communities which are genuinely traditionalist and patriarchal and social justice warriors would never even, even talk about it. It makes sense once you think about it in those terms in which I've described it as status signaling, not concern for victim groups. And that would be sort of Occam's razor explanation. Um, it starts making sense when you look at it in that way. Now, that approach, that, that status signaling approach can also explain why political correctness is firstly getting more extreme and why even though social justice warriors generally get their way they're never happy they always uh, they always have the impression that everything works uh, against them so normally when when they say we want to to no platform the speaker normally they get their way they they can no platform people who they don't want speaking and um, they can exercise political, uh, particular words, particular expressions. They, they, they usually get 
their way. And, and uh, politically correct witch hunts almost always end with the person who is the subject of that witch hunt apologizing afterwards. It almost never happens that somebody sticks to their guns and says, no, I, I, I did nothing wrong. If you, uh, my words have been misinterpreted, I stick to what I've said, that, that never happens. Uh, it, it almost always happens with that person saying, I am so sorry for the, for the offense that, that I caused and, and, and so forth. So uh, you, you always get the, the, uh, the result, like after Stalinist show trial, where the victim has to then accuse themselves and self-recriminate. And uh, in that sense, social justice warriors clearly do get their way, but nonetheless, they never seem, seem happy. And um, the state signaling approach can explain that fact as well. Because if politically correct opinions are a form of, are like a Rolex watch, a status symbol, then that has a number of implications because <coughs> status symbols are, in economic terms, a very peculiar kind of good in the sense that they are markers of distinction and they lose their value when other people acquire them too. So if I came in here with a Rolex watch in order to, to show off, to impress you how much money I have, and then I then discover that you all have Rolex watches, well, that, that would be sort of self-defeating. Uh, because then if everybody has a Rolex watch, it is no longer a marker of distinction. So the marker of distinction, the status good, is in that sense like a deserted beach. It is inherently scarce. We cannot all go to the deserted beach, because if we all go there, it is no longer deserted. So it is a good which is by definition scarce. It's not scarce in the sense that uh, this bar here that can run out of beer, in this sense, so, so then beer would be scarce, and that could cause conflicts if we all want more beer, and, and there's not enough for, for all of us. But that's a technical pro uh, problem. That could be solved by just brewing more, delivering more. Whereas a marker of distinction is inherently scarce. It doesn't actually, you, you, you can, of course, create more Rolex watches, you can, you can uh, create more of the good itself, but you would thereby destroy its value. The value that people derive from it, the distinction, is by definition scarce. It's, um, it's, its utility comes from the fact that other people don't have it. If I had the Rolex watch in order to impress you, then my, uh, my utility from, that I derive from it would come from the fact that you don't have them. And that's something uh, which an economist in the 19th century explored. Uh, Thorstein Veblen, he came up with what we now call a status symbol, something that seems obvious in hindsight, but wasn't obvious then. And he described how, um, how different people hunting for status symbols, how that is if actually a zero-sum gain because the, the gains they derive cancel each other out. They may acquire their status good, but if other people get it too, then uh, it, it cancels out the advantages to the, to the first owner. And that is something that you can actually apply to a lot of things. So what was incomplete in, in this uh, Veblen theory was that he thought of status signaling as meaning you signal that you have money. Status in his, in, in Veblen's world, meant money. But that's actually, at least for, for a more modern economy, no longer true. People can use all kinds of goods as status goods. It, a status good doesn't have to show that, that you have money. You can also use status goods um, in order to show that you are more sophisticated than other people, or more educated. It can, can, be, can, can be a lot of things, can be almost anything. People can compete in a lot of different respects. So a lot of goods that, that you may just consume because you enjoy them might be status goods for other people. Uh, you could consume a particular beer from a microbrewery because uh, it has a certain hipster status. But 
But then again, that is something which is inherently scarce. If everybody then buys that beer, it is no longer a niche product. It no longer serves to signal a, sp a special form of sophistication. And then there's a great book about that, which is called The Rebel Cell, how counterculture became consumer culture. Uh, that, that's a book which helped me to understand political correctness, even though it is not at all about political correctness, but it is about this mechanism of uh, conspicuous consumption. That book describes a number of movements that defined themselves, uh, or well, waves of movements that defined themselves as countercultural. So it starts with the beatniks and then goes on with the hippies in the 60s and 70s and then punks in the 80s and then the grunge people in the 90s and the early Nirvana fans and, and goths and, and what have you, all kinds of alternative uh, subcultures. And the authors uh, point out that those movements, those sort of uh, self countercultural <laughs> movements, often started from the premise that the preceding movement had sold out. So punks in the 80s would say that the hippies had become part of the consumer culture, part of the problem, that they had sold out at some point. And therefore, something new was needed. And um, the authors of, of this book, The Rebel Cell, explain why that is a misconception. It's not that any of these movements ever sold out. What happened was simply that you get a movement that starts as a countercultural movement, uh, that, that starts as an alternative lifestyle movement. And the early, the people who, who uh, take, who, who form this movement in the early stages, then derives a, social, a certain social status from that, because that requires the reputation of being edgy, cool, something that you want to be. And then other people see that and they also want a slice of this coolness cake. They, they, they want to be part of that movement. And then, but in this way, more and more people join the alleged counterculture, the alleged alternative subculture. But if lots of people join, it is no longer alternative. But if you define yourself as countercultural, <coughs> then you also need a mainstream culture against which you can define yourself. So being alternative, being countercultural, is again like the deserted beach. We cannot all be alternative. If a particular style is seen as provocative, edgy, alternative, and people derive a social, certain social status from that, and if that then becomes cool, others imitate it, then it ceases to be cool. Because coolness is also a positional good. It's like a Veblen good. It's uh, something that only works if not everybody has it. And, and perhaps another um, incarnation of that, before I get, you can see the parallels here to, to political correctness, but um, another application of this, which is quite relevant at the moment, would be gentrification. Because that's the same phenomenon. You get a group of early movers, a group of, of social innovators who move to a, a, an, an area, a borough, that, um, is, that then acquires a reputation for being edgy and cool because a certain type of, of person is attracted to it. <coughs> Artists, and especially in the beginning, alternative musicians and whatever, they move there they give that, uh, that borough a certain fame and glory, and then you get other people who also want to be part of that. And, but if, if everybody does that, then it ceases to be cool. It's no longer a distinction. It's no longer very special. So places like Brixton or Shoreditch would be very good examples of that. If you had said 20 years ago, I live in Brixton, people would have said, oh, wow. Nowadays, everybody moves to Shoreditch, everybody moves to Brixton. It's, it's no longer, um, well, it is the deserted beach all over again. It's no longer cool because everybody does it. And that, in that sense, coolness is also a positional good, and coolness is also inherently scarce. But it's quite different from 
the earlier form of positional goods from, from the Veblen goods, which are about showing that you have money, because these kind of goods, uh, these coolness goods, are a lot easier to acquire and to imitate. So suppose you wanted to suppose you you wanted to pretend that you're rich even though you're not. But that's very difficult because status symbols like say a house in Mayfair um, you could not just buy a house in Mayfair just to pretend that you're rich because unless you actually really are rich you couldn't afford it. So therefore this is a status symbol which will probably remain a status symbol uh, over a long period of time. This is a stable solution. But with coolness goods it's not quite like that because it's a lot easier to buy a CD from a band that is uh, perceived alternative and, 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 and edgy. It's a lot easier to move to a place like uh, like Shoreditch or, or Brixton than it would be to to move to to Mayfair because here in Mayfair they can effectively they can make sure that uh, not every not all and sundry can move there by the prices but you cannot keep people out of Shoreditch in, in that in that way you cannot uh, force them to under to take a coolness test before they get permission to move to Shoreditch so if you have all the uncool people moving in, then you get a problem because the early movers, well, how can they show that they are early movers? You don't see. If somebody says, I live in, in, in Brixton, uh, I live in Shoreditch, there's no way that they can signal that they already lived there before it was cool. And that's why you get these conflicts. People who protest against gentrification are never people who grew up in that borough. They're never people who have deep roots. They're almost always the first wave of gentrifiers. They're people who moved there while it still had that social status. And the reason why they are now so heavily opposed to other people moving there is that it undermines their social status, right? Because of, the, of this intrinsic scarcity. And that explains why anti-gentrification people, protesters, are normally also opposed to building new 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 houses in uh, in a gentrifying area. Which, if you take them at face value, if if uh, if you take this argument, oh, we're just against hipsters moving in because they're driving up the prices. Uh, if you take that at face value, then opposition to new development would be illogical. If you don't allow new development. Uh, that's when you get price competition. If you have the same number of houses, but more and more people coming, that's when prices escalate. If you allow development, then you can actually have uh, keep prices more or less stable, even in a gentrifying area. But the reason why they're opposed to that is, well, you can keep the prices stable, but you can't keep the coolness signal intact if everybody moves there. So that is why it makes perfect sense for anti-gentrification protesters like these, uh, you've all read the story, but these uh, serial killer cafe uh, people who, who threw color bombs uh, against the window of, of that cafe um, in order to drive out the hipsters. That's really about status competition because these serial killer cafe uh, people, well, they're undermining the status of the early movers. Now you can see where, uh, um, where I'm, I'm trying to go with this. That's what happens with political correctness as well. Um, if politically correct people use their, use certain words, certain expressions as status symbols, then they have a problem if other people do that too, if other people copy that behavior, if it becomes mainstream. So for, for for example, uh, this idea that you're now no longer supposed to say he when you're refer referring to somebody of, un of an unspecified gender. If you say the average voter, you're not supposed to say he. You, ha you have to say they because you don't know whether it's a, a he, could be a she. Or the, the economics textbook therefore always says 
the representative consumer, uh, who then sometimes say they or she, avoiding the word he. But that's become mainstream. A lot of people do that now. And if you want to show your feminist credentials, and if everybody talks the way you talk, well, how do you differentiate yourself? And that's the reason why political correctness becomes more extreme. That's why you have to see um, instances of, of sexism in, in, um, yeah, in, in events that would otherwise seem quite harmless and mundane to other people, such as somebody commenting on a profile picture and saying this is, uh, this is objectifying. And, and that is because the, what used to be the markers of, of feminist credentials 10 years ago are now mainstream. And that, in that way you can explain why uh, political, politically correct people have to become more extreme over time. In, because that's how you defend your, your edge, your social status. So it, it would be the same as... Um, People who, who support, uh, who, who, who are fans of some style of, of music that is considered alternative, and when that style becomes mainstream, they move to more extreme groups. And, and there, there's a parallel here. I mean, I, I remember this. This was the first time that I saw this uh, sort of status seeking in, in action, even though I didn't understand it at the time when I was a teenager, mid 90s. Uh, the band Nirvana was getting very popular. And a lot of Kids at my school, boys in particular, tried to look like Kurt Cobain with varying degrees of success. Now, who was most opposed to that? Not the teachers and not the parents, but the early Nirvana fans. Because if you had come to my school at uh, any random day in 1994, 1995, you wouldn't have been able to tell who were the early movers, the early Nirvana fans, and who were the imitators. And it's the same with politically correct speech. You can't tell if somebody uses the correct expression, if somebody says they rather than he. You can't tell whether I just started with that yesterday or whether I was one of the early movers who always uh, used that expression. And that's why you get these, these tendencies of, uh, of finding microaggressions where almost everything becomes somehow somehow dodgy and where you get accusations of dog whistling saying yeah well this looks harmless but there is something underneath here and and that is how people you who see wolf whistling <laughs> what did i say dog whistling no wolf whistling is certainly um, improper i think sorry ah uh, no no i meant um the accusation when somebody says something that is that seems quite harmless, but somebody says, a politically correct person says, oh, no, no, there's a hidden message in there. Is that a dog whistle then? Yeah. Oh, silent. Yes. You can, yes, you yeah. Can, yes, I see. Yes, you, you, you can only, you can only, right. only yes. hear at a certain frequency, so especially yes. fine-tuned if you have very uh, politically no, correct fine-tuned antennas. And... Um, like dogs. <laughs> and the metaphorical, politically correct <laughs> dogs would then use, the, communicate that ability that they can hear those, those sounds that, uh, that ordinary people are, are unable to hear. And therefore, it, it doesn't actually work against them if, if it seems ridiculous to an outsider. That's actually the point. It has to be ridiculous because it's meant to be a signaling opinion. If, if it were something that, that anyone could support, uh, then it, it wouldn't be much of a, of a signaling opinion anymore. And that is, but there we have a fundamental conflict at the heart of political correctness, because all these other groups that I mentioned, uh, the early Nirvana fans, uh, uh, the punks, uh, whatever it is, the gentrifiers, the last thing on earth that they want is that other people imitate their style, right? They want to well, freeze things at a certain point when a band, the band that they, that they're fans of or the borough that they live has just the right level of, of, of coolness perception so that people know about it, but not yet mainstream enough so that they actually want to move there. And they try to freeze it at that point. With political correctness, it's very different. Uh, they want to keep that, that, uh, that edge, that moral superiority, but they're also trying to force their norms on everybody. And because they succeed, 
they then undermine their own objective of standing out. And that is the fundamental conflict, and that's the explanation, I would say, the economic explanation why political correctness is so unhinged. And that's the reason why it will probably become more unhinged uh, in the foreseeable future. Thank you. Paul? Yeah, um, it must be a tribute to the um, attention-grabbing high profile of the Libertarian Alliance. I have to fight my way through thousands of placard-waving socialist <laughs> warriors <laughs> camped outside the university here trying to stop this talk play taking place. But, uh, <laughs> uh, eventually they'll catch on to what we say here and balance <laughs> before we leave. Um, but um, No, we're too far ahead of the curve. <laughs> I know. Uh, now, I was watching a television programme last night on Channel 5, which was supposedly a humorous look at what television was like in the 1970s, and the whole thing, as you say, was uh, status signalling throughout the whole thing. It started at 10 o'clock at night and went for three hours. And at every single advertisement break before the programme restarted, they say, be warned of unbelievably offensive, mind-boggling, shocking opinions. Or the worst thing that the worst thing that happened was that Ronnie Corbett appeared dressed as a black and white minstrel at some point. And Bernard Manning apparently was on television a lot in the uh, in the 1970s. And I was looking out for all these shocking and offensive opinions that they were constantly warning about. And the, and the word thing just people saying what they said in the 1970s. And um, and there were all, then the, the clip shows were all interspersed by talking heads. Oh my God, it's it all the things we did. I can't believe it. But even managed to dig up some nice sense relics like Lionel Blair or people go, oh, no, I can't believe I was in that. You know, it's, it's just, just all of them cravingly apologizing. It was, it was like an extended three hour show trial. Um, <laughs> it, was, it was really, really quite a remarkable thing to watch. All the red girls. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, that, that's fashionable too. Self-recrimination, uh, yeah. in, in in an abstract way, saying that, oh, yeah, I'm I'm a white man. I'm a f I'm benefiting from white privilege, and, and so but no, nothing follows from that. Of, of course, I'm not going to uh, give up my position and uh, give it to to somebody who is less privileged. Yeah, uh, thanks for the talk. Very interesting. Um, well, if, if what you say is true, then political correctness seems to be not entirely a status phenomenon, but, but uh, a market phenomenon, which is just a social phenomenon that, that people spread an opinion and it becomes a, a normal taboo, which mm -hmm. every society has, and then some people get annoyed by the taboo. So then the question is, how far should, should libertarians be, be, be uh, opposed to it? Because <coughs> I can totally see the annoyance with political correctness that a lot of people have, especially now that it founds its way into interaction laws. That, of course, is completely um, wrong. Uh, but a little problem that I have with the NTPC crowd is that they want to have the right to offend people with some NTPC, I must say. They want to have the right to offend people and then are outraged if. Uh, so then what happens is the right to exclude people and basically you put social pressure on, on, on people by, by what they say and whatever. But then they are outraged if someone does that to them because they use certain politically incorrect black words. So they, uh, there seems to be a little bit of a double standard on the other side of political correctness yeah. uh, as, as, as well. So mm. I'm, I haven't quite fully f made up my mind on that, but I, I'm not really in the PC crowd and I'm not really want to join the hardcore NTPC crowd either because they seem to be a little bit too far uh, on yeah. the on the offensive side which which I, I, I don't necessarily want to offend people I just don't want mm. the government to tell me which words I, I use and, and, and which people I deal with that's that's basically it but I accept social phenomena of people <coughs> not liking maybe what I'm saying and therefore exclude me or whatever and, and that that goes either ways, you know, that doesn't just go for, for racists, that also goes for the anti-racists who want to exclude racists, you know. Yep. No, there's no um, liberal or libertarian purist position here. It really is about uh, a social phenomenon. It's not, in this case, the state is not the culprit. It, it isn't something that is initiated by the state 
um, there are laws now. It does happen now that people get arrested for un-PC things, uh, but that's very much a recent thing, and that that crept in much later. In this case, it really is the government jumping on a, band, a bandwagon, and this is you you could say um, social self-regulation. So, uh, if you, if you only look at it from the, from this meter level, then on on those grounds, you you couldn't object uh, to it really. Except in so far that, while in theory you could say, well, these people are just excluding from their own <laughs> premises, their own meetings, they just use social pressure rather than uh, police force, that's fine. But it doesn't usually stay, or I have never met someone who, who, who uh, argues I want the full force of social pressure used against someone, but I would totally uh, respect their right to, to, to say it. You, you can make that case in theory, but somehow it never happens. It always creeps into if you can silence people and if you can use uh, formal sanction mechanisms, then it should happen. And Steve? Well, I think the talk explains something, but uh, in a way it doesn't explain anything really. Uh, it, t it tells you why a particular group of ideas becomes fashionable, you know, or why, a, you know, your example of the Rolex watch, or why a particular uh, the miniskirt has spread. But it doesn't really say why why this particular group of ideas, you know, what was it that caught on? So, you know, we, we, talked, we talked about the 70s, but in the 70s, when people, the things that people were talking about in the 70s were how, what a problem the trade unions were, or you know how big, how, how dangerous the Soviet Union was. Uh, very few people saw things like radical Islam or uh, DC um, ideas coming to uh, have such prominence. I mean, even in your example, you said um, you talked about the states. You talked about GM Foods, I think, and big corporations. Well, big corporations have always been. Some, some something you can kick around, you know. That that didn't just come along recently. And GM Foods, I think, belongs to the green movement. And I wouldn't say that that became a really big uh, force until the 1980s, really. And that's quite a substantial, you know. There's a quite a substantial body of ideas there. I don't actually agree with them, but you know, it's not just a fashion thing, is it? The green movement. Uh, well, it is in, in the sense that it has very little substance, that if, if you look at it empirically, almost all the claims are, are wrong, that people like Björn Lomborg uh, in The Skeptical Environmentalist, uh, Julian Simons, uh, they've disproven almost virtually all of the claims of the environmentalist movement, but people cling to it. I, I think it is mostly a status thing. But no, the, the reason why I, I mentioned that was simply to... Um, <laughs> You're, you're completely right, that's absolutely not recent, uh, and corporation bashing even less, that's, that's uh, as old as corporations. I was just using that example to show that there is such a thing as a high status opinion and a low status opinion, that there are uh, views that are not just neutral, that are not just like uh, me saying I prefer this beer to that beer, you, you wouldn't draw any conclusions about about me from that, that's uh, just a taste that I happen to have and with some political views that may be like that as well. If I told you the rate of council tax where I live is too high, you wouldn't know whether uh, I'm, I'm highly educated or not or uneducated or somewhere in the middle. But there are views that we would associate with high status and others that we associate with low status and politically correct views are in, in that high status camp. So that was the only reason why I, I brought up this GM versus immigration thing, because those are, would be examples okay, of high status, low status views. That is, you seem to be suggesting that become more and more extreme, although that doesn't text. You know, you could also equally a logical possibility, but well, it's difficult to make them more and more extreme. Why not just change the views? You know, and I'll, I'll show my status in a different fashion. I'll just have, have some different views. And they can be the high status view. You know, they could be libertarians. <laughs> and, and, uh, but, uh, it, it, you know, you're almost saying if, if it's just social status, um, 
Well, they're just something very uh, feeble and flaccid and uh, will change, and people could will be able to see that, that they're just fashion. And there's no need to take any policy decisions on, you know, whether someone's wearing a Rolex watch or what the, what's the level of a woman's dress, for instance. Yeah, but it then feeds into political opinions also being uh, about status. So that, in the sense that people then call for, for prohibitions and, and state intervention as a way of saying, I strongly approve of this behavior uh, or, or that behavior. So uh, in all of these cases in, in universities where speakers have been no platform because of, of because of their views, because it could be offensive to somebody. I don't actually believe that anybody seriously thought that any harm would come about if that person were given a chair and a microphone. I think saying that this person should be no platform, protesting, trying to lock them out, is just a very strong way of saying, I disagree with the views. Now, conceptually, there's absolutely nothing difficult about the idea that you can very strongly disagree and still not have a problem with the fact that they have the freedom to to uh, to, to express those views. But to say, well, if, if somebody has a controversial opinion, you probably have lots of students who just say, I disagree with it. That's not special. But if you want to be one step ahead of the others, then one way of doing that would be to say, I don't just disagree. I want to ban them. I disagree even more than all of you. And um, in in that way, there are real policy implications following from this status signaling. In that way, political uh, status signaling and fashion following is different from uh, the, the the sphere of music and uh, and and and, and boroughs and. Uh, uh, dress codes being fashionable or ceasing to be fashionable. I was just using that example uh, to, to illustrate the mechanism behind it, but with music, fashions and uh, gentrifying boroughs, fashionable boroughs, that's a harmless phenomenon. That really is just fashion, will fade, doesn't matter. But these political fashions do have policy implications. Bob? Uh You've been dealing with the demand side and the economic explanation. But the supply side, or the cost side, is equally important. And um, for many of these, these postures, you know, they cost very little, no great intelligence, no bravery whatsoever, no charm, no sophistication, no pop, no style. <coughs> Despite the idea that it shows you as in a good light, and also for some, which is why I like to call it not political correctness, but um, state speak or establishment speak. Establishment speak or stab speak, to make it sound even nastier. So stab speak is there because eventually you're going to be paid to engage in putting um, political incorrect things down. So in other words, there are careers to be made, grants to be won. It, it is fame and fashion, that's a part of it, but there is a side in which it pays. And there's also the pleasure in humiliating people and annoying them and upsetting them, which for some is a consumer good. Yeah, there, there, is, there is an industry now around it. For some, it really is economic uh, self-interest. If you go to any jobs uh, page and, and uh, type in diversity, equality, something, you, you will find quite a lot of positions and quite handsomely paid. There is an industry now around this. Either from the public sector or some organization that receives most of its funding from, from the public sector, or it could be a private corporation that just feels they're under pressure, they have to do this. Mm -hmm. uh, there, there, is, there is this industry now. I'm, I'm just saying I wouldn't explain the phenomenon in, in that way because somebody who demonstrates at a university uh, for no platforming the speaker, they're not necessarily at that moment hoping that they will one day work for the diversity industry. It might be sorry. now. <laughs> <laughs> uh, John, there's a boom, uh, oh, sorry, boom sector. This chap here, this chap here, John and then Paul. Um, yeah, thanks. It's an interesting moment in the speech. Um, 
I think it's important to make a distinction, perhaps, between two strains of sort of PC culture. There is the extremist sort of um, sh showing off your um, yeah credentials. Yeah, exactly, and um, sort of um, the Tumblr sort of I support. You know, it kind of went from feminism to trans, and then it was to people pretending that you're know, coming up with all sorts of very, very obscure sort of demisexual pan whatever and uh, it became so obscure that you, I think you've got a wide set of people who do very much use PC culture as a way of virtue signaling. <coughs> I do also think that there is a lot, of, and that, that is a countercultural movement where people need to have very specific, very obscure, very unique set of virtues that then just sort of shows them as above everyone else. <coughs> I do also think there's a large component of a more revolutionary or kind of political movement type element where they do actually aspire to build a critical <coughs> mass where more people involved actually elevates the position because it proves that you are part of a wider movement and it validates your opinion. Um, and to a large extent, or to some extent at least, I would say that that movement um, is at least, there is some factual basis in it. And I think as libertarians, we can get on board with many of, you know, it's, for, for, to my mind, uh, give, making sure that women have the same opportunities in engineering and men have better, have the same, have good opportunities as women in caring and, uh, you know, primary education is they're absolutely libertarian issues, making sure that people are judged on who they are and what they've achieved rather than uh, sort of prejudice against and things like that. I think to an extent, and as long as they are voluntarily dealt with rather than uh, dealt with by, by force, they're things we can get on board with. My key crux is that I do think um, there is a lot of batteries insanity in the kind of PC movement, but I do also think there are kernels of truth and there are kernels of things that are supported by evidence. And I think it's really important, and we've, we've got an opportunity to say, no, absolutely, you know, girls should have the same, exp uh, same opportunities as boys. It's not cool to uh, refuse to serve people based on their race or their socioeconomic background. Um, but to do that in a voluntary way and through peer pressure and through rational discourse where you make convincing arguments. Um, but we, I think it's important for us to do that at the same time as challenging the more crazy stuff that's going on, which is you know the kind of PC fascism that is uh, becoming very fashionable. Yeah, I'd, I'd say it's often the case that um, movements like that start with genuine concerns. It's It's not born out of a desire just to impress, just to be fashionable. I think that that mostly comes when most of that original problem, uh, when that is mostly solved, when there's, there's, there's just no, uh, it never happens that a social movement says, right, our objective has been reached, we've won, that's it, we dissolve ourselves. It doesn't work that way. Um, Ed West, the author, he, he wrote about this once. He said, no witch finder ever concluded that society's witch problem was solved. And I think that's where, where the problem um, comes in. But yeah, true. Um, they all have, they all started tackling genuine grievances and, and genuine injustices. So uh, I don't dispute that at all. It's just that when things like uh, this bed and breakfast owner uh, couple that turned away a gay couple, yes. Yeah. Uh, when that becomes a national story, when, when you can see that they're now so desperate to show that homophobia is still widespread, and there's, there's this one family in, in a country of 60 million inhabitants, then you could say the real underlying issue is 98% solved and um, yeah, the other 2%, well, we can deal with with some social pressure, some combination of, of social pressure, ostracism, or if it's never 100% of the, of the population is, that is uh, convinced, if you have a, a handful of, of bigoted people that say, well, then, then let them be bigoted. Agree. John? Uh, I take uh, political correctness to be something like the uh, privileging 
of the uh, relatively unsuccessful at the expense of the relatively successful, but on the pretext or, or possibly genuine perception, as they see it, of, of unfairness. Uh, but uh, the, the, the posing that you get where people are talking about what they think uh, as a way of uh, look at my beautiful ideological quote, aren't I a lovely person, is uh, uh, almost epic phenomenal compared to the real political phenomena uh, uh, which are, uh, involves people seeking physical power by offering people privilege, vote for me and I will give you this. I will shut these people up, I will persecute these people on the in inverted commas, they won't actually say persecute people, but you know that's what they're going to do uh, on, you know, on the pretext of being fair and they, they're actually going to get votes that way and the people who vote for them uh, know they're going to get a privilege and they want it. And so that, that, they are going to vote for that person in order to get that privilege. Uh, and that's that real materialistic um, uh, phenomenon is uh, rather more dominant than the, um, the sort of ideological pose. Mm. Though that exists as well. I, I don't think it's big enough for that. It's not, uh, it's still as, as <coughs> pervasive as it is in, in some circles. It wouldn't be a, a vote winner among Middle England. You won't win a general election by saying, I'll hire more diversity officers and lock up more un PC people. Um, I don't, yeah, but MPs exist in a, within a particular constituency. Hmm. What? Yeah, in Islington, it, I'm, sure, I'm sure it, it doesn't hurt you. If, Sorry? If, if you're the MP for, for Islington North, exactly. Yeah. It, wouldn't, it wouldn't hurt you. Yeah. yeah. Paul? Yeah, I, I think it goes further than just the MP for Islington North. It's, I mean, it's one of the reasons why they concentrate on the universities. It's not just simply to, to, for differential posing purposes, it's because the universities or where the leaders of the countries are going to come from. And you're quite right to point out that the law came a lot later, but the law now, over the last 10, 15 years, has absolutely intoxicated political correctness, which is uh, just piled on lots of costs on businesses. And it's interfered with freedom of speech and freedom of association. There are all kinds of laws against it. We live in a country now where some silly boxer mouths off some silly ideas to uh, a journalist, and people are calling the police about it. The police are constantly complaining they never have enough money to solve the burglary or anything like this. Yes. They're, they're all over it. You know, absolutely. The, 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 the police love nothing more than investigating politically correct offences, especially if it involves a celebrity. Um, so, uh, as far as the libertarian position is concerned, we're concerned about more than just what private people want to say to each other. It is a, it is a legal matter now, so it's an mm. absolutely important to libertarians. And, I understand you know, the aspect of the economics you were talking about, but it is piling up lots of costs on business, and it's all done with, with lies. Uh, people, uh, the government, even the Conservative government, absolutely buys into the agenda. They're, they're bringing a law on gender pay gap reporting uh, next year. Every organisation over 250 employees has now got to annually publish their gender pay gap and explain why it's there. Uh, this is a preposterous cost uh, on business, and, and more and more of it uh, comes through. Uh, and so it's not, it's not just listening to MPs, this is the supposed Conservative Prime Minister David Cameron says this. Every day, Conservative MPs mouth out politically correct uh, concerns. They're all scrabbling over from it, each other. And often, if they object to somebody else's perceived extreme uh, political correctness, like say they want to object to Diane Abbott, they do it by, a, by some sort of inverse political correctness themselves. So they, they tend to call Diane Abbott a racist because she wants it something. So she's a black racist. So they, 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 they're sort of using the language of political correctness mm. to, to attack their opponents. So it has absolutely affected society. It's having massive costs. It's disrupting liberty. And it's dragging us down. It's drag, dragging the economy with it because it's just piling costs. It provides barriers. The big companies love it, of course, because it provides barriers to entry. It's another way of shielding themselves from competition and rent seeking. So all of these things are going on. It's more than just uh, a bit of posing and differentiation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah I've, I've looked uh, a couple of years ago, I've, I've, I've looked um, when I was writing on, on, on labour market regulation at um, 
those discrimination claims and um, I, it's it's not as it's sometimes described in, in the Daily Mail that all you have to do is file a complaint and, and suddenly the company pays you a million pounds. But um, what, what you do get and, what get and what is not a good sign is an extreme dispersal of how much money is paid out. The the average sum is, is quite trivial, but you get this this long tail. It can be like winning a lottery. It can be that uh, that, that you get that you get nothing. But uh, that in itself shows that um, there is a <coughs> problem with trying to police these things because it's this is not a labor law claim like uh, suing your employer for not paying you because that, that's a relatively clear-cut case. Uh, they either have paid you or they haven't or that is uh, an amount specified in your contract. Either they've underpaid or they, or they haven't and therefore in those cases the, the amounts of the amount of money that is um, that is paid out is, is usually in a fairly narrow range with these discrimination cases it's all over the place and that's because of uh, of um, that's in the nature of the matter that here you're not talking about something that somebody did but about a perceived motive so the employer fires you and they now have to prove that it had nothing to do with your with demographic characteristics of yours which they cannot prove of course unless they had a control case where somebody uh, is in a different group or otherwise behaved in exactly the same way and so forth but yeah um, this chap over here. Oh, um, I was just jotting down my idea, so I say I'd be cogent. Just a very quick thing. Um, have you come across Durkheim? I'm not an expert. So he does the same. Emil Durkheim. Mm -hmm. And yeah, all I, I don't know a lot about it. He's found the sociology. Uh, yeah. He's like saying, and he said, young Martin. people have a desperate need to fit in, combined with a desperate need to stand out. So when yep. I had hair like this and I was in my twenties screaming fascist at somebody in a fast car, that's exactly what I was doing. Yep. And when you were talking about status and all that, all that sort of stuff, um, it sounded like different words but the same idea. Mm. So that was just a really short and sweet thing. But now I've got a big idea, which is, um, it sounds a bit name droppy, but the first time I ever read about philosophy was a guy called Montesquieu. And it was through history and what he said was, if you want to centralise, you go up to the serfs and you say, your local lord is actually git. And you stir it all up and you stir it all up. And the next thing you know, those people, those serfs have got Louis XIV, centralised power, and who's actually much worse. I mean, that was Montesquieu. And then I look at the absolute hatred that you're talking about the peace siege, I think it's something we, didn't, we underplayed. But then I thought about the motive in terms of the government, and by government I mean state television and state education, and are the government not very, very, do they not find it convenient that the whole population is calling each other racist, bigot, uh, homophobe, xenophobe, uh, scab, blackleg? I mean, the inward hatred and thought police we do to ourselves, is that not very, very convenient to a government that's out of control? I think the BBC and states. I think government love it, but mm. that's ourselves as a libertarian. Yeah, if I hope that's no, no, it, it is, it is, it is absolutely. No, of course, if you want a public sector career, then then that is of course brilliant for you. I, I just wouldn't go so far as to say that that is deliberate. I have no no evidence that that uh, they're, they're, they're thinking that far ahead. First of all, John, then you. What's the time? I don't know. Uh, nine o'clock, just about. Yeah. Um, uh, so soon enough, I can do have Although I think there is um, uh, a sort of underlying reality to the um, people voting for privilege and, and, and politicians offering them privilege, uh, obviously politicians are far more politically correct than ordinary people. Uh, and uh, which means that that, that alters the, the economics of the situation uh, by virtue of the fact that we don't live in a democracy. We, we live with an elected oligarchy and the ideology of the oligarchs is such that you will only be given uh, a, a, a 
potential oligarch to vote for who is sufficiently within the mainstream of what they think. So, for instance, uh, it might be popular to bring back hanging, but uh, when they, you're given your MPs to choose from, the dominant, you're not going to be given one <coughs> promise to bring back hanging for you because that's not what the, uh, the, the ideology of the oligarchs is. So they have their own, uh, you might call it Westminster bubble, uh, ideo ideolo ideology. Uh, uh, or Overton w window of what's yep. acceptable amongst themselves, uh, and I, uh, that's why. Uh, I mean, there's, so there are these two aspects. There's a real underlying: people will vote for their own privilege, but there comes a point where, even though the vast mass of people want something, still the oligarchs won't give it to them because, uh, well, they don't have to, and uh, they always plead that they're there not just to. Um, uh, do what people say, but to uh, offer them their judgment and good opinion, which is, in this instance, uh, politically correct across the board. Even, you know, Cameron comes out with this politically correct stuff. It's so pervasive that even people who say they are against political correctness and attack it, uh, in one's breath, in the next breath, will, will say, of course, racism is completely wrong. Nobody should discriminate against anybody. Said, well, why not? You know, that's surely that's just freedom of association. So it is a very pervasive um, uh, ideology. Anyway, that's the end of round. No, it's it's, <laughs> it's true. It may not uh, catch on among Middle England. It may never be the thing that uh, that determines. Uh, national election outcomes but it, it it is still the case that the politicians are recruited from a certain social circle and have their social feedback mechanisms in in, in within that circle and um, that's why you wouldn't get the populist politician who appeals only to uh, the small c conservative uh, wider populist that's that's why um, you know, so somebody who would do that would be ostracized within that social circle. Steve, then. You see, in the 1930s and 40s, the the attract the, the sort of common ideology was um, increased um, socialism, communism, if you like, nationalisation. And if you look back then, you could have said, well, you know, you get social status and kudos as an intellectual, and the vast majority of intellectuals were on the left uh, then, as they are now, in fact. And um, <coughs> by advocating, uh, you know, nationalization and things like that. And, uh, you know, you may have looked at it like that, but there's something more substantial, isn't there, about it, about whether, in fact, nationalization is a good thing for the economy or not, and um, how, how economies function best uh, in, in the world. And uh, I think your your approach to the political correctness is a bit is a bit like that, really. Uh, you know, the, the roots of it must be um, you know rampant egalitarianism, as, as, as I see it. And um, you know that's what we should be looking at, attacking. Uh, sure. yes. Not just now, but uh, uh, then. Uh, I'm going to no, I should have called you before. Sorry about that. Yeah, this is related to the point about the Antonius. Because you say, so for the social justice uh, warrior, their work is never done. But I would expect the movement to maybe start to peter out a bit when the work becomes too arduous, when the self flagellation actually begins to hurt. And I think part of the problem with political correctness is that it aims at abstract virtues and goals like uh, equality, which might be the gentleman over there reference, which are unachievable. And if you look at the sort of cold light of day at the composition of people and the world and existence, uh, don't exist in the first place. So we have very unequal inputs, and then we somehow want an equal output, which itself is impossible, even if you just consider the categories of sort of abstract things that are, they would still overlap. You might get a 50-50 split, men and women in, in Parliament, and then realize, oh no, but there are two black women and one black, one black man. Or, oh, if we want perfect equality, then we might have 
a completely equal split or completely equal representation, every possible category you could possibly think of. And then, but then are they are they speaking the same amount of time uh, in, as when, expressing themselves? So I think that's very it's very very dangerous. It should be very very uh, cherry of uh, abstractions. Um, so I think that's one of the one way to undermine. Uh, to, to sort of reduce the amount of fuel that social justice writers get is to continually question the validity of these abstract ideas. What about yeah. the abstractions which are correct? Right, liberty. <laughs> but still, <laughs> well, there's, uh, yeah, no, there's, there's all, there's, uh, not just liberty, I mean, there's any number of them. Uh, but yeah, this is where Burke goes wrong, you know, he questions abstractions. abstractions. It's still Actually, Burke. as closely and concretely defined as possible. Um, and often one will find that in speaking to someone in the abstract about how things should be done, you then realise in the, in the way actually they conduct themselves, they're completely contradicting what they supposedly profess. Uh, and, and so they should always be brought back to, oh, what do you actually do? How, do you do this? how does it sort of play out concretely? What do you mean by this? Um, rather than being taken in by these uh, yep. by the abstractions. Yep. Yeah, that, that, that would work. Not, not just on... Um, on as a mechanism to enforce intellectual honesty, although that, that is of course worthwhile in itself, but that also undermines the status signaling because as, as soon as you as you go down that road and saying, okay, well, what exactly do you mean by that? Do you mean this or do you mean that? And and people start, uh, uh, well, I, I don't really know. And I'm sure, oh, okay, well, apparently um, you have you are just virtue signaling here, and so it, it is still, still uh, worth countering with with logic, even if. The ideas themselves are not amenable to logic. Pat? The, yeah, um, I, I'm not convinced by what you're saying about it, uh, that the PC is, is a fashion statement. Um, it doesn't explain why the police or the state, as you have said recently, have got involved. I mean, you've always had PC uh, talk, the people acceptance of the PC. Uh, throughout history, but you've never had the involvement of the state and through the police or whatever bodies, or for example, you could lose your job or with a, making a wrong statement, you've never had really had that before. That is my point. Yeah. Um, exactly my point. I mean, I, I, would think, I would suggest there's something much more complicated than what you uh, suggested here. And, on the, and the, even in the political sphere, I can just give you a very simple recent example uh, with Donald Trump talking about banning Muslims from the US and all the uh, hullabaloo, uh, in, especially in the media, or, or with the fact that he's uh, racist for doing so. When this happened, a similar thing happened in the 1970s, I think it was Carter, I can't remember the president, I could be wrong on that, but it was definitely a US president banned uh, Iranians and Persians from going to the US at the time. <coughs> there was nothing like the hullabaloo that we've got now. Now that was racist, but this isn't racist, what Trump said. Techni technically, I'm talking strictly technically, um, what the US president in the 70s was racist, but there was very little said about that at the time, the general acceptance of it. I mean, the idea that it's anything to do with fashion, and if it's got some, or even if it's got some rational explanation, it, is, it isn't the case. In fact, if you actually sit with a lot of these people who uh, expose their PC views long enough, and, and you have a rational argument with them, and that's quite a difficult thing to do, I accept. I think what you'll find is even they will not have a rational argument for behaving the way that they are. So all I'm saying is I think it's something very complicated and it, it, it's, a, I would call it almost an unconscious reaction to some kind of phenomenon, technological phenomena that are happening that, that are beyond their control, which we don't understand properly yet. But uh, saying it's part of fashion, mm, no. Now, if maybe a technological fashion, mm, yeah, yeah, that might creep into it. <laughs> I think you can explain. Um even the state involvement with appealing to fashion because it, it is one thing to if you if you take social justice warriors by their own words what does it really achieve for them 
that somebody gets arrested for for a tweet, some obnoxious tweet. Uh, it, it, it doesn't really further their agenda that much. But what happens then is if you if, if it is, as I said, that these demands for banning things become really a strong way of saying I very strongly disagree with that. If um, if it's not enough to say I just dis dis disagree like everyone else, uh, you, you want to be one step higher, then you have to call for a ban. And then you couldn't easily, if you're in that fashion group, you, you couldn't easily say, oh, actually, these the police shouldn't get involved. Because once... There is the group pressure to say, yes, these people have to be arrested. We have to send a signal. Because that's that's uh, what they always say. That if, if you don't, when there have been say, radio discussions afterwards, uh, a couple of PC warriors against somebody defending freedom of speech, the argument is always, yeah, maybe this, this particular instance here wasn't that important, but it is important to send a signal. And you get that kind of logic. Uh, that if the state doesn't arrest you for something, it signals what you're doing is fine, which is of course a totally absurd argument uh, in, in, in the sense of the state doesn't arrest me if I don't say good morning to my colleagues when I come into the office, but that doesn't mean that uh, the state thereby signals that being impolite is a, is a good thing. But it would then be, once uh, once, you, once you set it up in this way, it would be difficult to pull out if you are in that social circle where things are interpreted in that way, that you have to arrest people, you have to ban things for this signal setting function. You couldn't easily say, no, I approve of what, I disapprove of what they say, but they shouldn't be arrested. On a logical level, yes, but if you gain social status by signaling just how strong you are opposed, not just that you are opposed, but that you are more opposed than everyone else, then you can't at the same time say, well, they should be allowed to say it. John? Uh, tell me whether I'm being unfair, but I think that the hypocrisy is built into physical correctness in a way that it isn't inherently built into other ideologies in the sense that uh, a, a lot of the uh, attraction of it is to persecute uh, people, but in the name of fairness. Mm -hmm. But they really, <laughs> it's the persecution really is what they enjoy. And a very good example of this is uh, when they say, they take, you know, somebody might have said something on the football pitch and they get a, a lip reader in to read what he might have said. And then they, they say, oh, what he said was so shocking that we're going to put it on the front page and in the news and on the headlines and make sure absolutely everybody hears this thing that nobody should hear because it's so shocking. And we're not going to stop talking about this absolutely awful thing that nobody should mention. And you think, why didn't you just ignore it in the first place? Because look, you're complete and utter hypocrites. You, all you want to do is persecute somebody who has an opinion that you don't like. You don't really. Uh, uh, care. care about he said it. Fact, you, you delight in the fact that he said it, so you have an opportunity to persecute yes, him and, there, and vicariously thereby uh, persecute everybody else who might have a similar sort of a view. Yeah, absolutely. There is there is the mob psychology, and that that, that appeals to something which is unfortunately uh, within human nature. Mm. That we we probably comes from from evolution from from old times. <coughs> we uh, enjoyed hunting with the pack, and uh, now, now we do that on on Twitter. And uh, there's some some echo of the of the ancient times in that. But, but this yeah. hypocrisy is within physical greatness, but it's not. I don't see it with other ideologies necessarily. Or not, not to any like certain extent. But it's not about yep. by status signaling because you can increase the difference between your status and someone else's either by raising yours or lowering theirs. Uh, so if you lower them, if you make them seem stupid uh, because they subscribe to the wrong opinion or they don't express themselves uh, as as you do, not benefit the system. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It doesn't explain the you can say education. I don't care about dreadlock people calling me a racist. I don't really see that. I object. Hang on, do we need to? I'm oh, sorry. <laughs> I think we should disperse into yeah. a period. Yes, uh, yes, uh, yeah, we should also carry on the discussion in the bar. Yes. Uh, no, I speak of, no, no, no. I speak of, yeah, yeah. I, speak of my, I have too much time anyway. Um, uh, 
So uh, thank you very much indeed for a very stimulating no thought. Thank you.